Forum. Borealis. Paradigm. Expansion. Greetings from the North, citizens of Earth. Welcome. Today we kick off another episode in our Esoteric Philosophy series, where we delve into lost and forgotten scriptures, particularly of Gnostic-ish blend and muse around their significance historically, philosophically and hermeneutically. And in the second half of part two, also go into the phenomenon of art and its almost vanished traditions and codes, opinionating about true artists whilst giving a due kick and a scrotum to modern contemporary so-called art. Some questions dealt with this. What do non-canonical scriptures claim? Who used them? Why were they censored? What value can we extract from them? And are they really a threat to mainstream faith systems? To guide us through this labyrinth of ideas and tradition, we speak with artist, author and lecturer Lawrence Caruana. Born in Toronto of Maltese descent, he graduated from the University of Toronto with a BA of Honours in philosophy and German. Subsequently, he studied painting at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, before he, in the year 2000, was admitted by the legendary artist and friend of Salvador Dali, Professor Ernst Fuchs of the Vienna School of Fantastic Realism, to directly work as his assistant in his studios in Monaco and Castillon where Caruana learned the classical painting techniques and codes in the traditional manner of master to apprentice. For years he led an itinerant existence, living variously in Toronto, Malta, Vienna, Munich, Monaco and Paris. His interest in sacred art and spiritual traditions has led to extensive travels exploring sacred sites and studying traditional art techniques of Gothic and Renaissance Christianity in Western Europe, Byzantine Christianity in Eastern Europe, ancient Kemetic tradition in Egypt, Hinduism in India, Buddhism in Nepal and Tibet, Mayan and Aztec culture in Mexico, Guatemala and Honduras, all enriching his passion for different cultural iconographies. After meeting his French wife, they moved to Paris, where he maintained a studio in the Bastille Quarter for 12 years. After the birth of their son, the couple bought an additional farmhouse in the Burgundy region, southeast of Paris, to pursue a fascination with permaculture. After leading the expanded visions in the Mischtechnik seminar for seven successful years at the eco village of Torri Superiore, Italy, where he was co teaching with Amanda Sage. He moved to the Josefstadt district of Vienna in 2013 to co found the Vienna Academy of Visionary Arts, which revives classical techniques of painting while pursuing art as the expression of beauty, spirit, and vision. It was first located next to the Hofburg Palace and in 16 it relocated to the Otto Wagner building in the alternative Neubau district and expanded across three floors to include the Vava cultural space and Vava Werkstatt. Lawrence shared administrative duties with Florence Menard while co-teaching or lecturing with well-known figures in the visionary art world like the legends Alex Gray and Andrew Gonzalez. After serving as its director for seven years, the 2020 pandemic forced the closing of the academy and he returned to France, fully dedicated to painting and writing whilst also pursuing a new project, the Apocryphon Chapel, which depicts the Gnostic Apocryphon of John in 12 large-scale paintings. 
He has also taught painting at the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies and the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors in New York, and often travels abroad to deliver lectures on visionary art, speaking at such venues as the School of Higher Studies and Social Sciences in Paris, the Metageum Conference in Malta, and Alex Gray's The Chapel of Sacred Mirrors in New York. His highly symbolic works explore the interplay of myth, vision and dreams while integrating views from different sacred traditions inspired by different cultural symbols and styles, experiments with entheogens as well as memories and dreams. He has exhibited his works in London, Paris, Vienna, Munich, Monaco and other cities, both individually and as part of various groups. Gek Lay reproductions of his work have frequently appeared at transformational festivals such as the Boom Festival in Portugal and the Ozora Festival in Hungary. His images has also been reproduced on album covers, in magazines, as tattoos, trading cards and in posters for transformational festivals. He has published several books, which we review in part two, and may have him back in the future to explore the two called Sacred Codes, the Forgotten Principles of Painting, and Enter Through the Image, the Ancient Image Language of Myth, Art and Dreams. Bon appétit! Welcome to Forum Borealis, Lawrence. Hello, Al. It's a pleasure to be here. And such an honor and pleasure to have you. Because I was so impressed by your Vienna lecture about old scriptures. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think the approach there was in context of the Gnostics. You know which one I'm referring to, right? Yeah, the Gnostic so, worldview, I think, that one. Yeah, I think, yeah, so. I think it's called Gnostic worldview. Yeah, so I was thinking today we could could go through uh, just in general ancient scriptures that didn't make it to the Bible mm-hmm. and let people know that there's a lot of stuff about this out there. Mm-hmm. Um, some in private hands, some in public, but uh, that we are aware of a lot of scriptures and basically just do what you did in that lecture. Sure. Uh, Okay. And then I'll chime in once in a while with my own observations or questions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, I mean, I I do know about non-canonical texts, but it's really focused to the early centuries of Christianity and so on. So uh, uh, just... You know, I don't mind discussing these other things, but I won't be able to give you my deep insight into, I don't know, you know, the Christ who went to India, for example, those kind of stories, you know. No, 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 yeah. uh, of course, of course. Uh, I mean, that's where I, I come in with my weird uh, little yeah, input, I'm just right, giving to you that little... a spice to your, your baseline, so that's no problem. <laughs> exactly. Okay, great. <laughs> but uh, uh, first things first, your last name, how is that pronounced? It's a Maltese last name, and in Malta it would be pronounced Caruana, but uh, I've heard every form of pronunciation, <laughs> so I really don't mind. I bet you have. Caruana, okay. So, Malta, is, is that very hard uh, stroke by the pandemic too? No, tour? they were lucky. Somehow it just didn't spread uh, very much. So, one of those things because even africa itself has not been very hard struck no it's true yeah and uh, malta it, it is first of all our history is very closely allied to northern africa like my grand great grandfather even my grandfather was born in, in north africa mm. you know and as a maltese but colon right malta had colonies in northern africa in in tunisia Right. And uh, and then now with the immigration, you know, refugees, so many black Africans are landing on Malta's shores as well as right. southern Italy. And uh, so there's this connection. You know, we can't get away from our African <laughs> connection. We're right there, <laughs> no. you know. So uh, yeah, it, yeah. it's strange to be in Europe and identify myself as European. Right. But always there's that African connection somehow, you know, the... Uh, no, Northern Africa. But but isn't isn't Malta ruled by the Brits or what's going on there? Like Gibraltar? 
It was, yeah. It it became independent in 1964, but uh, oh, really? So it's its own country today? Oh, yeah. Since 1964, it's been a republic. Wow. A rather corrupt republic, but a republic nonetheless. I didn't know. That. Uh, it's it's been having problems because they the last leaders in power they really wanted to improve the economy, and they did, but they did it in a way by selling European passports, like EU passports, and allowing <laughs> block, blockchain <laughs> to enter into, you know, so, but blockchain also can Whoa. include money laundering, and so there, it was, you know, they were advanced, but, and then the worst thing that happened, you can look this up very easily, is yeah. a journalist who shares my last name, uh, Daphne Caruana Galizia, uh -huh, who was uh -huh. killed. And this journalist who was writing about the government uh, wow. was very probably killed by someone closely connected to the government, you know. So it, it actually caused the government to fall. But uh, it Sounds like the mafia has gotten its foot inside because what usually happens when a place is very small mm -hmm. is that it... Uh, becomes the opposite of corrupt because it's so transparent, right? So yeah. it's easier to have some semblance of democracy and autonomy, like Iceland, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, there's definitely so, forms of nepotism, you know, but not mafia, not the Italian not Sicilian the Italian. mafia. They okay. they never managed to successfully penetrate Malta. But, okay. it, um, but this form of nepotism is everywhere you know like yeah. yeah and every time there's two major parties when one party gets into power everyone shifts you know the whole yeah, yeah. shifts and then but what, yeah. is, what is it with malta and canada because i know a girl in canada who's maltese mm. and into esoterics by the oh, way yeah so is that uh, two thirds of maltese and went there or yeah two-thirds of the maltese in the 50s emigrated yeah. outside of Malta because it was overpopulated. So right. my family moved to Canada, for example, like my parents and uh, others moved to Australia. That was the other main destination. Right. So lots of Maltese in Canada and Australia and then in the USA, of course. But yeah, um, but yeah. Makes sense. so that's why I grew up in Toronto, actually. So not, not many in England then? There are. I have uncles and Ants in England because of the. I would uh, assume that big colony. Yeah, but my yeah. parents traveled on a British passport when they right, left right, Malta. Right. Yeah, the whole Commonwealth thing. <laughs> okay, but uh, Malta, mm -hmm. oh, the home of uh, I, I guess the Johannites or whatever they're called, mm -hmm. um, or the Maltese Order. Is that a really uh, like if you go back? Is that of Spanish heritage or what's what's the culture and ethnicity there? I've always wondered about that. It is really, uh, so it's the Knights of St. John that we're talking about. And they were originally located in Jerusalem uh, in around 1100, 1200 to help uh, pilgrims who were going to Jerusalem as part of the, you know, the, the travel to the Holy Land. And then uh, as Jerusalem fell and then as Rhodes fell because they were stationed on roads, uh, I think also Cyprus, I'm not quite sure. Then they moved to Malta around the 13, 1400s. And they are really the children of nobility from all across Europe. Yeah, And so there were different long, as they were called, it's a French word. And a long was a league or a group from that country. So the Austrians, I mean, I'm going to use the modern country names, but mm. uh, you have to imagine Europe in the 1500s. So in those different uh, countries like the Austrians, the French, the Prussians and so on, they had their own leagues of knights and all the different leagues worked together as basically hospitalers as to help people on levels of health uh, as they made the pilgrim to the Holy Land. Mm. And according to rumors, also some refuge for some Templars. <laughs> yeah, and there's a there's a fascinating history. If you know the story of uh, Cagliostro, he was an alchemist. Who... Oh, we're gonna have, look. There's a new book. Sorry to interject here. Yeah. There's a new book out on him, mm -hmm. and we're gonna have uh, the author on mm -hmm. and go through his life story. I love Cagliostro. Go on. 
So, so one of the um, leaders of the Knights of Malta invited Cagliostro to the island to do his alchemical thing and, and so on. So the, the, the Knights themselves were definitely interested in areas like alchemy and whatever people were dabbling in in the 1500s. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, so they got, yeah, it's true, they went to Cyprus and then they lost that to the Ottomans. But... They ended up in Malta, okay, but there must have been people on Malta before the rulers came. I'm just yes. wondering, like, the names and the ethnicities and the culture there can't be 100% Johannet. So, oh, no. I'm just wondering, That's the a... people, Italian. For the Maltese themselves, that remains a huge question, because oh, wow. definitely within the Bible, in the Acts of, um, the Acts of the Apostles, it's, a, it's recounted that Paul ship was shipwrecked on Malta. And so the story is that Malta was basically Christianized from the time of 60 AD or afterwards. But um, the language that people speak in Malta is an Arabic dialect. Wow. So at some point when the Saracens moved across the Mediterranean and they conquered the north of Africa and southern Spain, they also conquered Malta. Now, they... Uh, Malta was liberated, so to speak, from from the Saracens in ah, uh, what was the date? I forget. I was going to say 1066, but that's another date in history. Uh, <laughs> but around that period, and uh, uh, by a Norman conqueror, and so Malta since let's say around 1100 has been considered European and part of Malta uh, yeah. Europe's yeah. history. So. The people themselves speaking with this Arabic dialect, were they surviving as Christians from before that time period or not? And if you look at key words like mother and father in Maltese, they actually show completely different linguistic heritages, which is a huge question. How is it that one word can be Arabic or Semitic mm. in origin and one can be European in origin? So it's a question that's never been satisfactorily answered, let's say. But the Maltese themselves think of themselves as Christian um, throughout history, you know, for the last 2,000 years. Mm. So the, the Arabs who came mm. were not the Moors uh, who took Spain, right? <laughs> It's not those, but... I, I believe so. I've, I've heard them referred to... Oh, it was those. Yeah. It's the Saracens, yeah. That in the same period that, that uh, the, the whole Mediterranean was kind of... Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then when the Ottoman Turks came in the 1500s, there was a siege of Malta. Uh, in And so the Ottoman Empire tried to expand that far, but were repelled. Uh, by the knights in Malta. They, mm. uh, uh, it was like a siege to try and take over that island as a stepping point towards Europe. Yeah, that's famous in history. And yeah. I, I guess they deserve, uh, they earned that credit because they lost in, in Cyprus and then they withstood it in Malta. So, mm. yeah, they can, they can have that victory as a feather in their hat. But today, <laughs> of course, okay. I, I think the Brit took over at some point. So English is the language there now or... Exactly. So though Napoleon walked in and had it was under the King of Sicily for a while, and then Napoleon took it over. Right. After Napoleon, the English came, and for 200 years it was under the English, and it was uh, received. Uh, it became a republic in 1962. I'm going to be. I'm going to show how bad I am with dates, but around that time, and uh, so English is one of the official languages, and people where the educated class tended to speak English, whereas mm. the the other classes spoke Maltese. And uh, Italian was also a language of the upper classes. And there's a whole long history about Malta being in favor of being included with Italy and being against Italy and, and anything that you would expect from mm. an island which is trying to establish its identity, right, you know, right. apart from other cultures. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. But... It is unique, I have to say, mm. that uh, having spent a lot of time in Italy, in England, and then in Malta, it's a unique culture. And one of the things that makes it unique is, for example, they're extremely Catholic, and yet the word for God in Maltese is Allah. Mm. And the mm -hmm. word for the mother of God in Maltese is Om Allah. So they're, they're using 
Arabic words while yeah. saying the, the mass, uh, a, a Catholic mass. So it becomes this very strange combination of history. Yeah, yeah, but but obviously, uh, I mean, Allah is established in many Christian denominations, like the Coptic Church and the Aramaic Church. Uh, just to you Americans out there, Allah <laughs> is, is just a, a Semite word meaning God. So it doesn't belong to Islam uh, per se, right? No, but it is weird. It is. I mean, it's such a loaded word today yeah. uh, that that uh, it is strange to hear the Roman Catholic Mass yeah. and then hearing this word Allah repeated uh, throughout. Especially because Roman Catholics usually use Latin, which again explains also why uh, Italian would have uh, sneaked its way into the upper class there. And uh, I'm assuming at periods of history they've been more obedient to the Vatican's than other periods of history. So, and you mentioned Paul, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, legion that he he got there. Uh, what a bad deal for you guys, because it, <laughs> yeah. here's my bias coming out, because when I look back to, and we're going to talk about this today, you know, the origin of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Paul is one of the bad guys in my book. Like, um, I'm convinced, I think it was Michael Bagent, uh, you know, mm -hmm. those authors the there. The Sword and the Chalice, I think. Yeah, yeah it's mm -hmm. one of those books where he explains, no, I think maybe it's his book on the Dead Sea Scrolls that we're also going to talk about today, mm -hmm. where he makes a good case that Paul was an enemy of James, brother of Jesus, and that they refer to Paul as Paul the Liar. <laughs> and um, according to, to all the scriptures so it's very interesting that the original congregation of Jesus after Jesus went out of the picture mm -hmm. was headed by Jesus' brother and that they there was an enmity between Paul and them of course Paul never met Jesus so mm -hmm. and, and I, I have to launch a conspiracy theory too before we get into the <laughs> core of the matter because look we, we know he was commissioned to hunt down Christians now yeah. what a very ineffective way to just kill random Christians like he did as a Roman soldier and also how bad for his karma so this so called vision he had of this cross in the sky Mm -hmm. Who's to say that he, he didn't just wise up and realize, hey, what if I hijack this religion? Hmm. That's a more effective way to crush Christianity. Hmm. And, and so, because, I mean, whatever he did, he did uh, to please the rulers. And they wanted to, we all know that religion has been used to control populations since yeah. the dawn of time. So... I'm thinking that could be an incentive that he perverted and twisted and made it into his own image. And and of course, we also know, and we're going to hear about that today, that one of the things Christianity has going for it, you know, some could say it's negative, but some could say it's positive, is that they're extremely flexible. Yeah, It's like they have no core at all. Like when they Christian uh, Scandinavia, they just put the new churches up on where the old uh, holy places was when they imported their theology you know it's too many similarities with older mm -hmm. you know to let it slide by uh, when they picked their holy festivals they used the pagan stuff so <laughs> they are such an amalgam of whatever was before mm -hmm. and contemporary that you know, it doesn't look like they had very many holy cows, as one say, uh, mm -hmm. that they were very, very easy to just make this thing and then use it to control the Constantine did. But I I'm getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> Today, uh, Lawrence, the idea of having you on, uh, there's so much we could talk with you about. And uh, if... Uh, a good willing, uh, you will come back and we will talk more. But sure. today we go into what I'm talking about now, only in terms of the scriptures, because people think that, you know, there's the four Gospels and maybe they've heard about the Gospel of Thomas and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So I wanted to educate them in the extremely huge world out there of sacred texts. And I'm inspired by your excellent lecture. Where did you hold it again, you said? In... Yeah, at the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art in Vienna. Right. 
and and people can f- easily find it online. Yeah. Before we go there, why did you? I mean, it's probably already implied in in what you just said, but just tell us how you became interested in these things. Okay, sure. By the way, the uh, on YouTube it's called the Gnostic worldview. That's it. So. I should mention we talked about my Maltese background, Malta being a very Catholic country. So I did definitely grow up within the Catholic tradition, which is important. Uh, I have to say that Catholics, as opposed to, say, Protestants, Protestants focus a lot on the word. Catholics focus a lot on ritual and symbol. Mm. And it's the nature of ritual and symbol that you're have a little bit more space to move into other traditions through the imagery and through the actions, the ritual actions and so on, rather than the literal word. And uh, when the word is taken symbolically rather than literally, then even the word itself can become a doorway to other traditions. So I definitely went through a lot of questioning in my late teens and early 20s. I studied uh, philosophy at university, which included hermeneutics, which is a form of interpretation and biblical interpretation. So it was at that time that I was exposed to the truth that uh, the Bible, which is the only book which is given in church and pretty much respected in our culture as the source of truth about Christianity, that the Bible itself is a collection of books in which certain texts were selected and included, and then other texts were deemed not worthy of inclusion. And in fact, the number of texts deemed worthy or not worthy of inclusion are are, are quite large. And you can use different rationales such as these are older, you know, the the four original Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke and John date to roughly around 60, 80, maybe 90 A.D. And so the other texts which have emerged, except for the one you mentioned, the the Gospel of uh, Thomas, which is a recent discovery, uh, all date to much later, like around 120. But even there, it's hard to date them because the a lot of the copies that we have are are date from much later, but are prob- probably the original was written, you know, earlier. But how early? That's a question of speculation. So, uh, so I was exposed to. A number of gospels of the life of Christ and gospels written by apostles like, um, well, James and John and all the classic ones. The Gospel of Judas got a lot of press around uh, 10 years ago because that came out into the public. And, and so all of these different gospels. Yeah, this is super interesting because it's key what you said that they uh, you know, the oldest fragments we have are not the oldest releases. Mm. They were older, and and we also know that you know from referencing them, like the Gospel of Judas you mentioned. I believe that was refer. We knew about it for a long time, but mm-hmm. a yeah, complete yeah. version popped up recently. So yeah, but um, and before we we go away from these kind of you know the gospels, you said that the four canonical ones that are accepted they are from 60 to 90 AD so um, mm-hmm. do we so, so all the others like Philip Mary all of them are I mean there's no older gospel found that's been dated no. older not Thomas no. there are there are fragments uh, what are called the Oxyrinthian fragments and you have fragments but they're not complete gospels and it's Again, very often, the only way we can identify these fragments is by seeing, oh, that actually parallels what we have in the Gospel of Matthew or in the Gospel of... So, uh, I should mention that it was really German scholars in the 1800s who were called philologists at that time, who were the first ones to read the Gospels closely and start to piece things apart and start to ask themselves questions like when were they written, who was referencing who, and so on. And what they ended up... Yeah, is that when they invented the Q speculation or hypothesis? And that's where... Yeah, that's where the Q hypothesis comes from. And Q from the German word... 
Quelle, which means source, that they believed that, um, let me think how this goes now, that that uh, Luke and uh, Matthew were referencing Mark and the Q document. Because when you read these books closely, you can see that uh, everything that you get from Matthew and from uh, Luke actually gets sourced from Mark and some other source, which um, they couldn't quite put their hands on. What is extremely fascinating about the uh, Gospel of Thomas, which showed up in 1945 in Nag Hammadi, is that it's a Q type of document in other words it's a, just a list of sayings it's not mm. it's called the gospel of thomas but it's not a gospel it's not a story it doesn't tell the story of the life of christ it's just a list of sayings mm. and so they assumed that these list of sayings existed but uh, here you were or with the Gospel of Thomas from Nag Hammadi, uh, you actually had this source list of sayings from Christ. Yeah. And I should mention that the Gospel of Thomas has canonical sayings from that end, ended up in the Gospels. And it has non-canonical sayings, which are definitely... Um, some of them are Gnostic in tone, other than others aren't. So it's an interesting document. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anyone who's read it will immediately re recognize. I mean, this is spirituality, the, the, the Gospel of Thomas. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff in the Bible, you can question how spiritual it really is. But mm -hmm. suddenly we see a depth in, Christ, in Christian, Christian lore when we read stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's on, on par with anything, you know, you can get on the contemporary New Age market. So, right. uh, you know, for me, I'm impressed when something spiritual uh, smacks of timelessness. The more something is colored by the zeitgeist, the less spiritual it is, because I believe uh, one of the basic motivations of spirituality should be to try to lift yourself out of the context of your time, geographically, culturally, historically. Mm -hmm. It's super hard, of course, but if it doesn't, it doesn't have that much of a value. I see often like Honestly, I think Buddhism is pretty timeless and works at any given time. So no wonder that's such a popular expression of religion. But back to these things. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll give you the gist of the story of how the Bible came to be as I've seen mm -hmm. it. And that's in um, uh, 325, I think, the, the church meeting in Nikea, where the church fathers were called to come together and agree upon a final version of this new religion. I think on the behest of, was it Constantine who, who was behind that? Mm -hmm. I think it was the Emperor Constantine. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm like you. I'm a little bit hazy on that part of history. But, uh, <laughs> okay. Go, well, go ahead. You're doing fine. Between us, we'll reconstruct it, I'm sure. Yeah. And yeah. so there was a heated debate because, they, of course, they there was no one who said who's the who's the right believer and who's the heretic, right, at that point. Mm -hmm. So the, oh, many Gnostics, and they couldn't, and the apocryphal story goes like this, they couldn't agree about which one should be picked up, so they appointed to come back the, other, the next day to finalize the discussion, so they left all the papers on the table. And when they came back the next day, everything was on the floor, except the four Gospels we know today. Ah, and yeah. so, oh, okay. God has spoken. Now, obviously, who had the key to the room? The story doesn't tell, mm. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is pretty crucial, right? Mm -hmm. So if, whether this happened like this or not, it just goes to show how random the whole process was and how political it had to be to, to come about. And... It's always bothered me, and so th this is why I think it's important to get to know some of these scriptures that didn't make it, because in many ways they are a hundred times deeper than the stuff we already are familiar with uh, in the Bible. And when I say Bible, I'm really referring to the New Testament, because the Old Testament is a dreadful piece of literature. I mean, who want to worship that good? Mm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being biased, but that's my attitude. And 
the listeners will have their own. So let's rewind then. So Thomas, they think, could be older than even the four canonical Gospels. Is that right? Well, I don't know if they can date it that precisely, but they believe it comes from the first century. So uh, where in the first century is, is still a matter of debate, but definitely early. Yeah. Compared to the other texts that we have. So do we have, uh, do you have any inkling of how many Gospels there really are? No, well, that's where it becomes interesting. And uh, so, for example, one text which I mentioned in my lecture, which is a standard text, is created by a German scholar named Schneemelcher, Melcher or Schneemelcher. Mm -hmm. And it's basically called the um, the apocryphal uh, texts. And apocryphal is a very general word. So apocryphal is is all the non-canonical texts. And the number of non-canonical texts is quite large. It, it it goes into the, I would say, 100 at least non-canonical texts, larger, smaller fragments and so on. So out of those non-canonical texts, a large segment of them then get classified as being uh, Gnostic and and uh, Gnostic is probably the largest category, and that comes from one of the early church fathers named Irenaeus, who was writing against what he saw as heresy, and the heretics that he groups together, uh, he groups together under the name of Gnostic and the Gnostics. And so that is kind of stuck through history because until this Nag Hammadi discovery in 1945 that I mentioned, we didn't have very many of the original texts. We had a few, but mm. not many. Mm. And what we only had was the heresiologists, as they're called, the people like Irenaeus and Hippolytus and who were writing against those uh, other groups within Christianity, and were actually citing their texts as they were writing against them and showing that they were wrong. So we had these pieces that we could find through history and piece it together and say, oh, okay, so now at least we know that this book called the Hidden Book of John, the Apocryphon of John, probably mentioned this passage, this passage, this passage, we could piece things together, but only in 1945 well, that's not true. There was another version that existed about 100 years earlier, but it never got published. Mm. Uh, so by 1945, the Apocryphon of John had emerged in three complete recensions uh, in the Nag Hammadi Library. So we, now we finally had this text in our hands that, that could be um, you know, put together and interpreted and translated and so on. So that's the story you know, of how these things work. That That, in other words, it's a gradual process where even say Irenaeus, who was in the, uh, he lived in the second century, mm. he was already saying back then uh, only the four, the Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, only those four are the canonical gospels. And he knew. Oh, that's before the church meeting in 325. Yeah, mm. exactly. Before the church was the official mm. uh, church of Rome. Mm. So already they were debating amongst themselves who was heretical, who was not, who was Christian, who was not, and, and so on. So it, it was a long process of weeding out the heretics, so to speak, which uh, lasted almost all through history, that there's always been some underground form of Christianity to, to emerge that is not you know, part of the official church. And that's a long story in itself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we could uh, speculate that... I mean, some people believe that Jesus doesn't even exist. Um, but yeah. there is also, of course, the question of John versus Jesus. But let's say he did exist. And let's say there were scriptures preserving his stuff. Now, I, I think calling all the censored stuff Gnostic is kind of unfortunate because it paints a picture of a monolith alternative. And right. as I understand Gnosticism, it's anything but monolith. In fact, you can even say there's Gnostic impulses that aren't Christian at all. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's it's more about discussing if something, you know, a religion versus mm. Gnostic or religion versus spirituality. Like, 
there is one definition that says that the the religious follows his church's guidance, the spiritual follow his soul's guidance, and in that definition, Gnosticism would be the latter, of course. So, mm. when we knew Gnosticism through the adversaries, through the winners of history, then w- we thought it was we believed until. The, the caches of treasures popped up later, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nagamadi. But until then, we believed it was more or less a monolith thing. I guess. Uh, I would like to suggest something which was very important in my intellectual development. Mm. And that is that uh, when I came to looking at what I had acquired from the Catholic Church in terms of a religion, I started to realize that. Uh, every form of spirituality goes through certain stages in history. And it was actually uh, Goethe who wrote about this. And he suggested that uh, the stages is that it begins as a mythology. And a mythology is very poetic. It's pure poetry and, and myth. And from mythology, it develops into a religion. Religion. It starts to become more organized. And once you have the religion, you start to have the next step, which is the church. And once you have the church, you start to have a theology. Hmm. And a theology is trying to rationalize and piece apart and, and seek out contradictions within myth and say this contradicts that and so on until you end up with a philosophy, basically, because, uh, you know, theology in its final stage becomes philosophy. Mm. So are we talking about myth or are we talking about theology? You know, because Mm. something that's monolithic is monolithic. That's what the church is trying to do is create a theology with papal bulls and and that the Pope is infallible and, and so on to say that, this is monolithic. Yeah, it cannot be. The, the, everything is is one clear statement on mm. on your spirituality. But when you read the Old Testament and then you read the New Testament, you're you're thrown so many contradictory passages. God is acting so strangely in the Old Testament, and Christ is acting so strangely in the New Testament. There's no consistency. Mm. So. You're, you're left to pick and choose, basically. And I, I believe that uh, coming back to the Gnostics, because they're very interesting, uh, they were writing uh, in the time of the first, second, third centuries. And I think that they knew that theology is not going to do it for us. Trying to say this contradicts that is not going to work. So we're going to write our own gospels, our own myths. And we're not going to say that this is canonical and that is canonical. This is monolithic and that's monolithic because each person is free to come to their own moment of revelation regarding divinity and the role of some savior in all of this. And that's what they were doing. And that's why when you read uh, a lot of these non-canonical texts, are they are they uh, historical in the sense of history? Mm. Not at all. Mm. But do they have a mythic kind of truth to them, where there's the sayings and the insights that they're expressing have some kernel of truth to it that touches you? Yes, absolutely. And that's the way I think all these texts have to be approached: is is the the kernels and and you know I. I come back to Gnosticism because that's my specialty. Gnosticism is full of those little gems and jewels, those little uh, koans, uh, a statement that is so poetic and yet so resonant with experience and truth mm. that that you just stop your reading and think and ask yourself, hmm, I think that person actually knew something and is, was articulating something that's meaningful for me. Mm. Yeah. So that that's the way I'm approaching all of these texts as not monolithic kind of statements of of religion, you know, but uh, or theology for that matter, but but rather as as uh, poetry and and looking at it on the poetic level. Isn't it true that many Gnostics groups even had <clears throat> internally conflicting lore? And they wrote about it. And it yeah, like for sure that uh 
you know, in, in one Gnostic text, for example, uh, Peter says to Christ, uh, Mary should not be included, Mary Magdalene should not be included among the apostles, right? And then you get vice versa, other apostles saying to Peter, Peter, who are you to question Mary as being one of the apostles? You know, so they, within themselves, they were constantly uh, having this infighting, mm. but that was part of the process in a way, is they were more interested in a diverse uh, expression of Christianity mm. rather than some theologically precise form which which no one could contradict. Uh, besides, I think it's very important to emphasize, and I discussed this with, um, and, and you know the dude, uh, Miguel Corner, mm -hmm. that, you know, today we ask, okay, where's your membership card? What do you belong to? It's very clear cut borders. But in these days and all through history, there's often, I mean, it, it really depends on the religion itself. I mean, some religious constructions are so fanatical and power tied up to power that they will be purging and mm. this is the correct but usually it's like if you're a at least the founders of the religion or the inspirators to the religion if you are an illuminated being a, a buddha a, a jesus a, a rumi whatever you're walking around and you're seeking the wise of your contemporary times you want access to the mysteries you want to be initiated you you're not uh, oh these are persians i can't go there oh no these are egyptians i can't no it was the opposite there were no clear cut right especially when we come into the more esoteric and mystical aspects of these things they didn't have these borders i'm sure that the buddha Lao Tse, and pythagoras were more or less contemporaries. I'm sure if mm -hmm. by some weird uh, turn of history they met, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, I, if I'm ever going to write a novel, this is going to be the plot of the novel yeah. that they're meeting in India. But if they did meet, they would recognize each other. Mm. They wouldn't start like, oh, you're the wrong religion. And that's the problem today that we are so black and white and into labels, which they weren't then, which uh, even emphasizes more this low bar between having differences and mm -hmm. uh, what may seem like contradictions. And then, of course, you know that uh, contradictions doesn't even have to be negative. It can be a spiritual too, like in Zen, right? Like like mm -hmm. the paradox. Mm -hmm. Comment? Yeah, it makes me think that uh, where Gnosticism really grabbed me was the idea of fundamental oneness and the core i don't want to use the word teaching the core realization of gnosticism is that divinity is one we are one with divinity one and is all and all are one that's a very profound mystical statement which transcends language and it has to be experienced for oneself mm. now when you get that, that means all forms of division, all forms of separation, all forms of us and them are false categories. They're categories that we recognize, but recognize that we have to overcome. And I would say that the Gnostics were kind of like, okay, I recognize these categories. I recognize what they are, but... I'm not going to fall into the trap of uh, acting in such a way that it's going to dictate my behavior. Mm. So it, it, they, they had a curious path they had to walk because they kept on emphasizing again and again, all is one, we are one. And to live your life in accord with such a precept is very difficult, actually. It, it, it's, it's a continuous challenge. Mm. But that challenge is what makes it interesting that challenge of seeing your enemy as yourself and and seeing the other as oneself is is the way to navigate your existence as you go through life mm. now are you familiar with a scripture called uh, i think it's called the gospel of barnabas hmm. it made a lot of brouhaha because it was discovered it's been re referenced and i think there's been versions of it but now they've discovered a, a version in england in fact they discovered i think it's this one uh, that islam 
actually Muhammad was a Christian. It was a ver- of course this is this Islam won't accept at all. But it was a v- version of his tribe was a version of Christianity because there were so many outliers, and so the weird thing is that he seems to have. Uh, they say this is the oldest document. Mm. No, you know what? I'm mixing two different things. There's the Gospel of Barnabas that. No, I think you have it right. Yeah, yeah but they found another one that is the oldest of of um, of Muhammad, mm-hmm. where it shows that he belonged to a Christian or he created a Christian branch or something that obviously became Islam. Of course, we know Muslims accept uh, everything before them in the Abrahamic. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do accept the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures. They call it the people of the book. Mm. So in a weird way, they are the most tolerant of them all. <laughs> Christians uh, accept what became before them, Judaism, <laughs> and the Jews don't accept any of those who came after them. So that's basically how it goes. And you could, mm. of course, add the fourth one in Iran, what's it called, a um, couple of hundred years ago. Uh, the man, Baha'i. The man you know, Baha'i say that they are... Oh, the, Baha'i. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, it, it's very interesting that if it's correct that the spark of Islam was really a renegade Christian group, then it just goes to show how coincidental and artificial these labels we use are. Mm. That everything, everything, if you compare, you can find two expressions that identify as Christian today, and you can find more differences there mm-hmm. between those two expressions mm-hmm. and one of them and another a religion's expression, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you understand the point? I do, yeah. I'm thinking of a saying from the Gospel of Thomas, this text that we mentioned, yeah. where he, according to, you know, it begins, Jesus said, and then Jesus said, um, the kingdom of God is within you, the kingdom of God is without you, mm. uh, or, or outside of you. And what he does very often in this text is articulate uh, contradictory, self-contradictory sentences, yeah, like these these koans that we were mentioning before, and that's a big one. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is without you. Because it, it reminds me of Her- Hermes as above, so below. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> well, that's a bit different, I would argue, I guess, but I I, I can see the the I, the rationale of comparing them. Mm. Uh, where you, what I'm trying to get at is, if the kingdom of God is outside of you, um, and what he goes on to say in, in the fragment is, he says, then the birds will precede you. If if the kingdom of God is in the heavens, then the birds will precede you. If the kingdom of God <laughs> is in the seas, then the fish will precede you. In other words. If it's out there, someone's going to get there before you because right. they know the way, right? But right. if the kingdom right. of God is within you, who's to tell you the way within? Only you. That uh, people can point the way and suggest the way, but it's only up to you to decide what is the way if the kingdom of God is within. Right. And I come back to... All of this canonical authorities of saying that this text is historically, and and that's something else definitely worth mentioning, is the concept of history. Because um, Mercia Eliade, who was a historian of religions, made the remark that Christianity is unique, Judeo-Christianity is unique because it treats history as sacred and literal at the same time, that that we believe in a Christ who existed 2,000 years ago as a human being historically, and in this kind of mythical Christ who accrued all of these stories around him and so on. And so we put a lot of weight and importance on history as if, ah, like science, you know, scientifically <laughs> we can yeah. prove that, you know, archaeologically this and, and – but – is that really, if, if you find the text, which I don't know, archaeologically proves that Christ was not crucified, for example, is that really going to change your fundamental belief system? Right. And if it does, well, we probably are not speaking the same language because I don't think truth resides in archaeological history 
when we're talking about spiritual questions. Mm. So it, it, it's a very delicate kind of question. It, it, it's a very important point you're raising because the problem, of course, is that these scriptures deals with all aspects that deal with uh, or what seems to be a history, a little narration, but they also deal with the law itself, the spiritual impulse, and they deal with the mythology. So you're right, they are sources to all these things. And I guess back in the day, they weren't big on distinguishing anyway. And often, yeah, yeah. you know, the question of what does this poem, if you call it that, or this artwork, what is the truth for them? What What is it that it expresses that you can recognize and apply in your daily life? Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Not the factoid truth of today's material-brained, nuts and bolts, logic, mechanical, Newtonian worldview where, yeah, believing everything is ordered and factual and it's materialism, basically. So, yeah, back in the day, they were more uh, concerned with what... You know, just like a, a novel, mm -hmm. a novel can be fictitious and have more truth in it than exactly. a piece of fact, right, that has no truth in it. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I recognize that. And as far as paradoxes goes, there's also this wonderful scripture that you're big on mm -hmm. uh, that is just full of them. And it's called Thunder Perfect Mind. Uh, yeah. Like every statement is balanced by the opposites. Like... I am the virgin and I am the whore. <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and blatant contradictions like right. uh, I, I am the daughter of – no, I am the mother of my daughter, things like this, where – it's impossible to be the mother, uh, the daughter of your mother. You know? right. No, wait, I'm saying that went wrong. I'm the even in the southern states of America. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, and this is this is the point: is when people take things a little too literally. When t people take things and create those groups of us that where they cannot understand the them. And uh, but I wanted to you were saying something and it made me think that that we are at a stage in history right now where we're involved in something called identity politics and identity politics oh, is yeah. really Oof. about questioning all of the categories that we use to separate things. And that can go as far as male, female or rich, poor or white and non-white and so on. Now, you know. I think of a word like tradition and is the word tradition a good thing or a bad thing? You come from the North. You come from a tradition which involves, you know, Vikings and so on. I come this, from the South, the tradition of the seagoing peoples of the South of the Mediterranean. Historically, we were in conflict with each other. And I think we can still identify with our traditions and yet – not provoke conflict with each other. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Not hold on to all of those, um, the traumatisms that resulted from the past. Mm. And a lot of people who are Christian are uh, adamant in their Christianity because of the traumatisms that were inflicted. And, and so that they're kind of either absolutely holding on to their Christianity or they're wholesalely rejecting their Christianity because of those traumatisms. Whereas the middle path of kind of accepting it as our European, general European tradition, you know, of, of Christianity, but not getting stuck in the politics and stuck in the, um, the church's very narrow definition of what Christianity is and what Christianity did through history, whether it was good, whether it was bad. The moment we start making those kind of judgments is the moment we find ourselves walking certain paths that are going to emphasize our differences rather than our commonalities, you know? Yeah, which is very unspiritual, uh, the differences thing, because all true spiritual tradition points to our uh, uh, oneness, a uh, union, mystic, uh, uh, yeah. exactly. uh, you know, the, just the word Catholic Church, it means the universal, ch it's universal, right? Mm -hmm. Even in religion, the, at least the idea, if not the practice, has survived. Uh, uh, you'd be hard-pressed finding a religion that excludes human beings. 
Yeah, exactly. And uh, but to arrive at that place takes a degree of reflection, takes a degree of thinking for oneself to to question the authorities, question the truths that have been given to you over time, right? Which means questioning your tradition. Mm. And I think we need to question our traditions, but that doesn't mean we need to reject them wholesale, you mm. know? Um, there's still value to be found in our traditions. And it's a question of differentiating between what is valuable and what is not valuable for us today. Yeah, I agree. A good traditionalist should do exactly that, uh, preserve what has value. I, I think a traditionalist, and I identify as one, uh, main job uh, is to... Uh, make sure the baby is not thrown out with the bathwater because the bathwater will automatically be thrown out all the time anyway. <laughs> the zeitgeist mm -hmm. makes sure that happens. Yeah, so yeah. if you go to politics, I often I behold so-called conservatives and I'm asking myself, what is it that you want to conserve? It doesn't seem like what... Because the idea of conserving is brilliant, but there should be something worth conserving and we're often so-called conservatives do not conserve what should be conserved apart from of course dogma and um, those kind of things so i think it takes a spiritual impulse a mystical mind a deeper level than what we could call the religious level mm -hmm. to be able to recognize and understand these things like i'm convinced that the great avatars did the great masters of spiritual thought and philosophy throughout history. They were not dogmatists. They were not concerned about your membership card. <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. And, and, and when you talk about uh, the conflict between inferring what's historical, what's universal spiritually, what's mythical, you have all, one thing is the scriptures that we mentioned some already. One thing is that. Another thing is... Uh, like if we read about Gnostics from the Church Fathers, yeah. that's the same as reading about uh, Gnostics or Jesus, because I believe he was a Gnostic. That's uh, reading about them through other religions. And it's so interesting because it's not just that we have censored and lost writings from the people who identified with Jesus himself. But we also have writings about Jesus from secular sources and other religious sources. And one of my favorites mm -hmm. is done by, uh, he's from, uh, what's that contested area between India and Pakistan? Um, Bangladesh? Oh, west. No, no, uh, further north in Himalaya. West, uh, oh, I see. Lak Lakdash or... Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm blanking on the name of the country, but they are fighting over who should have that part of it. And it's where many people in the world believe Jesus ended up. Ah, okay. Uh, there is this Kashmir. book. Yeah, Kashmir. Kashmir. Okay. The, yeah, there is this book called In Search of the Historical Jesus. It's done by uh, the Minister of Culture for uh, Kashmirian government. Mm hmm and he is using source material not available to us in the West, uh, but he uses a lot of source material from many different religions. And even Tibetans have, uh, they called him Issa. Mm -hmm. They tell how he came with the uh, Silk Road mm -hmm. and how they established the Church of, um, yeah, it's the Church of Thomas, I guess. And so they say that the crucifixion was a ritual. And that uh, Jesus uh, survived and that he went all the way to the, his tomb is still in Kashmir and people all over Asia. There's a lot of Asian Christians. You have the, mm -hmm. uh, is it Nestorians? What are the Gnostics in a Asia called? Um, yeah, and the Nestorians, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you have a lot of people going there to commemorate Jesus. And in Islam, there is a similar tradition. They say also that he survived the crucifixion. In fact, everybody seems to agree about that. <laughs> but that he went to Persia where he married a new woman uh, or, mm -hmm. or got a child with her, not Mary, because Mary went to France, mm -hmm. I think. See, exactly. And this is where I mean, uh, is this history or is this myth? And, right. uh, you know, in, in France, which is where I live, um, I live very close to the Church of Vézelay, where the remains of Mary Magdalene are held as relics. Right. And it was part of the 
pilgrimage route to St. James Compostela. Now, at one point, the church decided, yes, these are the genuine relics. At another point, it was like, no, they're not. They're actually housed some in another church 200 kilometers from there. And, <laughs> and you can see how quickly history becomes political. Right. So uh, it, when I go to that church and I see those bones, which are said to be the bones of Mary Magdalene, I say, okay, like here's my opportunity to uh, connect with Mary Magdalene through something, whether, you know, relics is the ultimate problem for the modern man because they're so obviously fake, you know, the, 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 the relics that have turned up through history, like <laughs> the nails of Christ's cross and the piece of the genuine wood and the, uh, the other famous example would be the Shroud of Turin. All of these relics, mm. how do we as moderns try to wrap our mind around what they're supposed to be, you know? But, Carbon 14? Well, Buddhists have relics as well. Like every stupa is supposed to have a relic at, right. it, it, you know, at its center. And uh, this is a worldwide tradition. Of course, you want some concrete manifestation of the sacred within your grasp. But whether it's historically the thing mm. is not really uh, – should not enter too deeply into the question because science is never going to give – yeah, carbon-14 dating, you know. So that means the Shroud of Turin is, is uh, not authentic, right? I don't, I'm not going to – I love the Shroud of Turin. Yeah. It's an amazing image. I'm not going to let some – scientists carbon 14 dating decide for me how i respond to that image because it's such a profound image and such a profound idea that this flash of light you know somehow imprinted the face of christ onto this veil uh, it, it it that is so mythical i, I heard it's jack de molay <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let let other traditions. But isn't isn't that a negative? Isn't that the first real photography in history, uh, in known history at uh, yeah, least? Yeah. Yeah. But I, and I say let other traditions. If it is Jacques de Molay, let let yeah. that you know become part of the tradition as well. As far right, as I'm concerned, right. I think we're only enriched as a result of that approach, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I did want to come back to a point which you were getting at earlier, which I think is important, and that is that the texts that emerged uh, specifically from uh, Alexandria in the first, second, third centuries of our era. That place in particular on the northern shores of Egypt, which was a city founded by Alexander the Great and invited scholars from all of the Mediterranean world to converge, you know, and, and, and speak to each other. And from Alexandria, we have the Gnostic texts, but also alchemy and um, hermeticism and theurgy and Neoplatonism. And there's so many interesting traditions that converged and created uh, important things in the esoteric field for us that, as you said, there's this sudden enrichment of Christianity that took place in Alexandria in that time period as a result of all these traditions crossing over. Mm. That I believe that's where we are now in history again, that we are at a point in history where uh, traditions from around the planet are crossing over and trying to find the way to communicate with each other. Sometimes it's conflictual, and we see that between Islam and Christianity, which becomes a whole political question and so on. But other times, uh, this, and I don't want to even use the word dialogue, it's more of a, uh, when two traditions come together and actually merge, syncretism is kind of mm. the technical word for it, the syncretic way in which uh, traditions can merge with each other, that fascinates me. And especially when the symbols, you know, and the stories and the myths. Yeah, but but isn't isn't Christianity just one huge syncretic? Syncretic, yeah, syncretic, uh, for sure. That's how it, it spread through the places it spread to, right? Mm. Which is why we have Santa Claus and everyone yeah, else, right, right, right. the Easter Bunny and all these crazy uh, uh, things that emerged from, from the pagan, what's called pagan European past with Christianity. 
Um, no, it, 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 it's fascinating. What I don't like is when things are suppressed, you know, like as you mentioned earlier, churches were built on top of sacred sites. And on the one hand, it was trying to preserve the sacredness of that site, recognize it uh, in its history. Mm. On the other hand, it was also suppressing and trying to uh, what was there. Mm. So it, it, it's a very difficult portion of, of Christianity's history of the things that it repressed rather than integrated. Mm. And uh, that's been a that's been a horrible story, you know, for for a lot of indigenous peoples uh, that we know today in the 20th century, what happened to indigenous peoples in Norway, what happened to indigenous peoples in Canada, which is where I was mm. born and, and, and so on, you know, is, is a terrible part of our history. Mm. No, I totally agree. We have to ask ourselves, what's the value of this rather than uh, what's the fact of this. Now, I want to ask you about one specific document uh, in case you know uh, know it because I'm fascinated by its assertions. Mm -hmm. It says that um, uh, after the crucifixion, the uh, point, uh, elected 12 disciples who were uh, having the task of spreading the word mm -hmm. came together and they agreed upon one common one mutual uh, document, and then they wrote each their own in addition. And mm. obviously their own, we know, that would be Gospel of Philip, of Mary, of Luke, of John, etc. Mm -hmm. But this one that they did together is called the Gospel of the... And I'm, use, I'm just translating back to English what it's translated to my language. So I don't know if that's what the original title in English is, but the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Mm. Are you familiar with this one? No, I can't say I am. Um, where I wish, I wish I had it in front. Are of you me. getting yeah, that information from? It's it it sounds interesting, but uh, okay. Give me give me a second and I'll retrieve it. Okay, and I'll give you the details. Two seconds. Mm -hmm. Sorry about taking all that time. Um, <laughs> I have Googled it in the meantime. and uh, <laughs> Okay, it was so hard. I have so many thousands of books, but I did find it. It's, so you Google it. So yeah. um, let's see. What does it say? If it's Wikipedia, it's probably just denouncing it from the outset. But mm. So the guy who is associated with they say it's a complete Aramaic arch gospel. And Osley is the chap who is credited with its right. discovery. I don't know if it's genuine. Yeah. Well, I can only give you Wikipedia, but basically it, it, it only appeared in the late 1800s, 1898, as a kind of a gospel which supports a vegetarian viewpoint. And there's been no actual... It was published, in other words, uh, in 1901, but the original text has never appeared anywhere. So it's kind of a suspect gospel, but... Uh, <laughs> it, it is, but are, are you familiar with Nicholas Rorish? The painter? Yeah. I, I know him as a painter, yes. Uh, He's an excellent painter, and he was a great yeah. mystic too. Mm -hmm. um, he um, uh, found a similar version in um, Tibet. Oh, wow. Uh, it was even announced mm. in 1926 in uh, Wien. <laughs> <laughs> Vienna, well, okay. so mm -hmm. in the, the uh, newspaper Der Tag. And Rorish found it in a Buddhistic cloister called Hermes. Fantastic. Uh, and <clears throat> this document is from uh, 400 after Christ, so it's not as old. But uh, there they refer to Jesus as Issa. Mm -hmm. And it tells of his story to India to study with the learned people there. Mm -hmm. So there are other, and I also have actually mm. Nikolai Notovich mm. who claimed that this is the Tibetan manuscript about Issa. It's called Issa, Prophet from Nazareth. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Mm. There's also this, you know, every time these things pop up, people dismiss them. But it looks pretty genuine to me. I don't know, of course, if... What I'm saying is, I don't think these people made them up. 
hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. They found something, but mm -hmm. it may have been made up four hundred after Christ, right? So, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think what the uh, main question is, perhaps, is that uh, it, the the gospels definitely that came down through history and Christianity mm. emphasized the role of the church as the mediator for people. That uh, if you want your sins to be forgiven, it is through the confession, the sacrament of confession, and that is what will allow you to enter into heaven. So there are these afterlife conditions, you know, these conditions placed on your afterlife existence, which uses the church as the intermediary. And actually, mm. you know, Buddhism has the same thing as well within the Buddhist context, uh, you know, that there are. But um, we in the West prefer to view Buddhism as this kind of inward turning enlightenment uh, philosophy. Now, I would argue that Christianity is also an inward turning enlightenment philosophy, yeah. but you know, where do you find it? it? It's there in the in the canonical gospels, but it's hard because we, our view has been interpreted by the church throughout history that we can no longer see it. And one of the benefits of the Nag Hammadi discovery, the Gnostic texts, is that suddenly it became clear that the way to read so many of these sayings, like the kingdom of God is, you know, even that word was translated in different ways. The kingdom of God is among you. Mm. The kingdom of God is within you. Mm. And, and, and it's a crucial translation question because if the kingdom of God is within you, well then, you know, all these things that you're, trying to do to get into heaven at the end of your life, the afterlife question, becomes resolved by what you do in your own heart. And uh, the church really doesn't play any fundamental role. That played itself out through history with Protestantism and, and so on. But uh, when you read the text themselves, as a contemporary human being, there is a way to approach it all uh, as through your trusting in your own judgment, your own heart, your own spirit to, to, to understand the answers to these questions and to find the answers to these questions, because they're pretty fundamental. You know, it, what is the nature of divinity? Where did the world come from? Where is it going? What happened to you before you were born? What happens to you after you die? Mm. Those fundamental questions, every tradition tries to answer through their stories and it's up to you to see which one resonates to allows you to to find the answer to those questions to your own satisfaction you know to to bring relief to your soul basically yeah but that presupposes two very important factors that usually are not present one that stuff isn't censored so that you're shaping someone else's view which is basically the whole point of censorship is to starve people for sources so that they will end up with a paradigm closer to what those with the power to select what we should be fed and not uh, want. Exactly. Uh, but the second is that there are optimal translations. You touched upon this. And if the translation sucks, we kind of, again, what's in our heart and the value we take out of it is, is robbed again. I'll give you a quick example. You know, a big dogma in churches in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, I read arguments that, uh, and, and of course you have to be a linguist expert, you have to be expert in many things to <laughs> make things optimal, but this does not mean word as we use the word word because then they would not have used logos. Mm -hmm. They would have used, I think it's rema or something. Uh, th that is the Greek word for a colloquial expression being uttered like a word. Whereas if they use logos, a more close because logos can mean many things. It can mean, it can mean even sound. It can mean idea. Mm -hmm. mind mm -hmm. and if you use such a translation you get a whole different twist on it then it's in the beginning was the idea or, or the mind mm -hmm. and the mind was with god and the mind was god mm -hmm. bam mm -hmm. 
now uh, it's changed completely, right? So yeah, absolutely. stuff like that, I think is, and people are not aware of it. People don't think about it. When I say people, I mean the man in the street. Um, there's enough who, of course, does. But these are the challenges. And that, that's why it's wonderful to live today. Mm-hmm. You know, you should either live today or you should live, live uh, before they agreed upon with the Bible, because you have access to so much more source material that can help form, mm-hmm. form uh, impulses that can help form your, you know, y- your own approach to, to these mm-hmm. mysteries is my point. But it, it does for me, uh, ask me to question myself why am I attracted to this view onto the world that conspiracies exist and also that secrets exist? Yeah, the, the, the definition of esotericism, I, I believe, right. is that um, there is a secret tradition. And if there's a secret tradition, that means that there's also another tradition which has been presented to us as the uh, official narrative, mm. which is questionable or somehow trying to uh, influence us in a way that we're not totally able to understand. This view... Well, hang on, hang on, yeah. hang on. I mm-hmm. would say if anyone does that, it's the powers that be. It's not those who are in secret because those in secret obviously of underground they don't have the power to uh, define the public discourse right as the powers that be would mm-hmm. no, yeah but that's you, you you presumably mean a secret tradition within the powers that be or no no i actually meant that the genuine tradition the the true tradition is secret you know that's what esoteric right is. right right but you touched on something else which is to say that the powers that create the conspiracies um, are secret, you know, like, right. the, and, and that becomes a whole other shadow, if you want, a shadow world where you believe that the, the powers which are uh, deceiving you are not of your own creation, but rather exist out there as this one cabal of individuals who hold all the power. Or you can take it further. You don't even have yeah. to say individuals. You can say entities, you know, archons, stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm i not casting judgment. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. I'm just saying that why do we think this way? Why do we feel ourselves convinced in our bones that there is this this um conspiracy you know of of archons who are trying to control us Mm. yeah Mm. and part of the answer to that question i would argue is that those who care about their freedom those who who are able to ask the questions and so seek freedom you know, start to become aware of those things. Now, whether they become so aware that they travel down rabbit holes of conspiracy theories and end up being the Unabomber, you know, is another question, <laughs> yeah. right? That mm. that uh, you you have to question, and then you have to not go so far down the rabbit hole um, that you get lost, you know, Mm. in in all of those conspiracy theories. And uh, definitely with the information overload that we have today called the internet and so on, it's very easy to to go down those rabbit holes of conspiracy theories and so on in the in the genuine quest for that hidden truth. No, I I agree. But I I think some of the responsibility uh, is not just on the seeker, because even if it's like a a rabid, proverbial tinfoil hat guy screaming about Illuminati, there's one healthy impulse in that person's um, situation, because at least he's discovered the lie. That's when people, when people, when the Maya, when the illusion uh, explodes that's usually when some people tilt because they can't handle they're used to this secure safe lullaby childish view of the world then they realize oh my god stuff isn't as i've been told the hypnosis the matrix is cracking right mm-hmm. and then they can't handle that usually they uh, f- fall off the wagon or many manage to you know get back on track 
But I would say if it wasn't rigged to begin with, <laughs> if we <laughs> could trust our leaders, the people wouldn't resort to this kind of, you know, Thomas the Doubter. You know, everything is in question now. Everything. There's no... It's a hard time to be a traditionalist because everything is in question. Mm-hmm. And and for good reason, because those who are the proverbial powers that be, I mean, it used to be the Vatican, who knows, uh, CAA now, wh- whoever it is, they're doing a very poor job of convincing anyone that anything. And then you have just a fragmented media landscape. And there's so many factors going into this that I think... An end stage is not being a paranoid, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, seeing a conspiracy everywhere, Mm -hmm. but it could be a step to higher enlightenment. Well, that's where uh, to navigate the matrix, if you want, uh, it is really a question of whether you're acting on fear or whether you're acting on... Yeah, acting on what is the opposite of fear, trust, that uh, whether you are being guided by the truth that's in your, that you feel within your own heart, mm. that that is not being mediated to you through all these structures of fear. Mm. Um, and I have to say that those structures of fear, the big one, I think, being scarcity, mm. are given to us in our ancestral inheritance you know that uh, our fathers and forefathers and mothers and so on suffered through some form of traumatizing conflict that involved scarcity mm. and we re-experienced that in our own form over the course of our own lives and so ah i have to do this and this to avoid that happening to me and we start to act in such a way that which is naturally human to to Uh, want to anticipate tragedy but when we start to act on fear before anything has really even happened to us then we start to limit and restrict ourselves and the question of freedom comes in again you know are we restricting our own freedom to act by acting within these set ways which are being dictated to us by our own fears Mm -hmm. and uh, Mm -hmm. and definitely we know that the media which is just one form. You know, the media is surrounding us with fears, but religions do the same thing. Mm. The religions surround us with these fear structures, and we have to stay within those narrow confines of action to 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 avoid uh, transcending the limits or boundaries. Right? Yeah. The the Gnostics probably became very interesting historically because they were. The heretics, they were the ones that questioned the boundaries. They're the ones that went over the boundaries, right? And uh, and many people are interested in the Gnostics because they were the heretics, right? Mm. And the heretic is actually not a bad place to be <laughs> because, <laughs> because probably the heretic is thinking for themselves at some point. And they don't create the heresy. Someone else judges their thinking as heretical, right? Right, and, right, right. Yeah. Good point. But it should be transferable to other domains too then, uh, like political heresy, cultural heresy. I mean, heresy is a function, a needed function. And uh, I dread actually dragging the figure of Satan into this because uh, the adversary Mm -hmm. um, and then you just disagree where, what's the adversary's throne? Is it is it a heretic who is going against the established order? Or is it the man behind the curtain on top of the throne who therefore deserve that we uh, go against him as heretics? You know, that's it suddenly becomes political. Huh? Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've talked about Gnosticism, so maybe I should take a moment to just uh, lay out the the, the the Gnostic worldview and its basics, of course, yeah. amongst themselves, they had their different versions. But in its basics, that the creator of the physical, uh, material cosmos was a demiurge who went by various names like Yalta Baath or Saklas. And he was 
ignorant. Uh, I, I'm hesitant to use the word evil, although that can be applied to him as well. He was, uh, according to the Buddhism, uh, ignorance is the root of evil. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's put it that way. And uh, so fund he's blind. That's the other way he's described. The blind god, and he's basically blinded by materialism, by ego, and by all of the passions associated with ego, like greed and desire and envy and hatred and anger and, and so on. So uh, he created a cosmos in which the planets, this is the Gnostic viewpoint, yeah, a, a cosmos in which the planets are beaming anger and hatred and desire and all these negative emotions down to us. Hmm. But the Gnostics believed that we are material beings and we are soul beings in the sense that our, our the soul in the sense of the heart, the place of the passions is open to those influences. But we are also spiritual beings. We have these this core of light. And this core of light in our spirit allows us to become aware, to know, and, and to decide the path of freedom uh, and to navigate the way through all of these influences that are constantly impinging on the soul uh, from the cosmos around us. And uh, whether you believe in this kind of vision of the cosmos where the planets are doing these things or not, uh, certainly within life today, when you turn on any form of media, be it a book or the internet, you know, you are being fed those constant uh influences right. and those influences can you know lead you astray which is coming back to the satan idea you know mm. satan is the one who distracts who leads astray who tempts and and who uh, takes you along the wrong path so you can try and define that wrong path through dogma and give Ten Commandments or whatever. But uh, fundamentally, the way to walk that path is just by by trusting in that you are spirit, knowing that you are spirit or light and that you have the ability to to follow the path of freedom in your in your. Um, yeah. Yeah. There is an esoteric guidance that says that if you follow your values and your good intentions uh, the, the, the presupposes that these are built upon a uh, spiritual conviction of course not mm -hmm. like not like if you're getting your values imposed upon you from some fascist structure for example but mm -hmm. so if you follow that th then you will you know uh, jung introduced uh, term synchronicity which is obviously not a modern discovery but that's what we call it today and then that flow will tell you when you're on the right path or not mm -hmm. those signs so so and, and that's a very gnostic approach because then you're not going like you said by by outer dogma by rules and regulations but by where the invisible hand guides you. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to come back to the question of fear, because uh, fear is not something to be avoided. We need to recognize our fears. Mm -hmm. We need to become aware of our fears. And so uh, all of these, what the Gnostics call negative emotions, fear, desire, and so on, it's not that uh, they're forbidden. It's rather that the more you come to know them, you the more you come to understand what they are and what they are doing to you. And mm -hmm. so it's a question of uh, knowing your desires, knowing your fears, knowing your hang anger and, and, and so on uh, and what they do to you, you know, how they restrict your own freedom to, to act in the world. So yeah. I, I just think it's important to mention these things because um, – Coming back to everything like conspiracy theories, you know, it's constructed through fear. Now, mm. I'm not saying don't construct a conspiracy theory. I'm saying construct a conspiracy theory in the awareness that your fears are generating this. 
Mm. Right? And mm. go there knowingly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so go knowingly down that rabbit hole, because we all do, mm. but uh, without being too attached to your own fears and, and so on, because with the moment you do become attached to them, then you are uh, lost, basically. Yeah, in Jungian terminology, then you are ruled by the shadow and you will do nothing but project, which is what uh, many conspiracy theories who deals with the more intangible stuff. I mean, one thing is political conspiracy theories like Gulf of Tonkin and 9-11 and JFK. I mean, that, those are very factoid things. Mm. But when you start thinking that, you know, the, the Illuminati and or like some kind of ism is ruling the world. I mean, there is one ism ruling the world, mammonism, <laughs> money. But like, oh, the Catholics are behind everything. The Jews are behind everything. The the Knights Templars are behind everything. The Gnostics are behind everything. I mean, mm-hmm. the and 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 then you you're really not in touch with the, the spirit anymore. You're it's a kind of a crude materialism, where you point out that the wrong genes or the wrong lineage or the wrong idea uh, and and all, all sorts of stuff that when i say idea i don't even mean idea idea i mean like the wrong scriptures the wrong uh, so so it's become very material in that way and nothing would be better for our cons mm. <laughs> than if we had that perspective and in fact if there wasn't such a thing as our cons history would have to invent them right because mm-hmm. who wants to there will always be people who want to control other people uh, people mm-hmm. who are motivated by greed by fear as you say by ignorance by power lust and they will whether they are entities or human beings or both they will try to ascend to positions where they have these powers. So let's say, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that Jesus did exist, or Yehoshua bar Mariam. Let's see, he did exist, and that he did try to bring uh, an impulse of love and and the way home, etc., to Earth. Then, as soon as the creation that he left behind, or maybe he didn't even create it, maybe other people just took it and run with it, like like a Peter or a Paul. Mm. Then, let's say that, and, and that becomes a power structure, then obviously this will have to decay. It will have to be turned into a grim shadow of what it originally was. Because all the people who... Who, who wants, to, who are motivated by the wrong things will be attracted to it and run towards it and try to grab it and dominate it. So, uh, ironically, if the Catholics are afraid of Satanists, they have become the Satanists, so to speak, mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. this perspective. And one more thing about this, and that's that if you uh, then instead try to turn to a more esoteric minded approach then you would not try to build huge vehicles on earth that anyone can see and covet and desire you would rather want to go under the radar so that you could preserve the purity because you know this world is full and and we see that in old hermetic writings don't we where they warn against becoming too many where they warn against public scrutiny Mm -hmm. i think in fact hermes says you should avoid you know making people think you are better than them or worse than them because there will always be those who envy, those who either becomes angry at you for being better than them or uh, looks down at you. Mm. No, I, I'm really butchering the whole uh, idea here. Mm. I forgot the details. But the point anyway is to keep thing hermetic, sealed, mm-hmm. so that it can be conserved. Mm. I mean, it's a interesting question, which people have ask themselves that at what level do humans uh, start to create hierarchies, basically. Mm. And the kind of number which has been used is 20. That once you start to have a group larger than 20, you start to have divisions within the group, subgroups. And once you have subgroups, you start to have hierarchies emerging, conflicts, and so on. So... It, it, and I think 20 is really the maximum in the sense that uh, having a group of 20 people interact harmoniously 
<laughs> uh, to, to, <laughs> that they could unanimously make decisions where all feel like their needs are being satisfied and so on. You you understand the difficulty yeah. Yeah. of of creating the kingdom on earth, right? In this uh, imperfect place. But uh, certainly communities of 20 seem to succeed. And then if you can make this somehow, I don't know how, as some kind of un- underground tradition in which those those uh, values are preserved of, of the oneness within that community, which is probably, you know, where Christianity started in that small very small underground kind of place. Mm. But as you say, any group with the highest of intentions, once you start to introduce all of the necessities for survival and so on, would quickly become corrupted, unfortunately, you know, given human nature. So, Mm. yeah. Super interesting. Uh, I mean, Mm. there's many esoteric uh, groups that say that, uh, the biggest number of a local unit, whatever you call it, a lodge, a temple, whatever, is mm-hmm. some say 21. 21, yeah. Yeah, like one leader, I guess, or a teacher, whatever, and, and 20 others. And some operate with the number 13. Mm-hmm. Which is Christ, around Christ and his 12 apostles. And yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the last philosophical question is reincarnation. Because if you take a look in the Bible, you will find very poorly censored uh, bits about, in fact, some parts even survived where it's implied that reincarnation was the norm. Mm-hmm. Now, we all know that. Uh, the church never officially banished reincarnation from their law. In fact, we know that there was the wife of one of these uh, emperors who <laughs> is such a psychopath. She didn't like the idea of reincarnation because it meant consequences for her actions. And she was famous for torturing and killing mm. people. So uh, she forced her husband to make the priests uh, or, or the church or whoever to he he wanted them to banish it, but they never did. They just removed uh, most parts r- referring to reincarnation so that karma wouldn't be a problem for her. Mm-hmm. kind of reminds me of the Chinese government who didn't like the idea of the Dalai Lama reincarnating without their control. So mm-hmm. they, f- they made it illegal for him to reincarnate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then they trumped up their own Dalai Lama candidate. But anyway, mm-hmm. are there traces of reincarnation in any of the non-canonical oh, yes. documents. Definitely. And I think it should be expressed that uh, the ones that I'm referring to, the Nag Hammadi texts, which are mostly Gnostic, they uh, reference Greek, Judaic, Hermetic culture throughout. And in Greek culture... Definitely metempsychosis, as it was called, was a common strain that from Pythagoras onward, there there were Greek philosophers who believed in the idea that the soul is reincarnated in some form. So when the Gnostics created their texts, they integrated Judaism, Christianity, ancient Egyptian thought, and Greek thought. And the Greek idea of metempsychosis was the main way they viewed the afterlife, that they believed that, uh, I'll express it in the clearest way, that there are three types of people. The, those who are mostly spirit, those who are soul, and those who are only body. And that we have all three components, but certain people favor the body more than the soul or the spirit right, right. and so on. So for them, the those who were body would basically perish. The body-centered ones would basically mm. perish because the body perishes. Those mm. who were soul-centered, uh, which is to say they were centered more in the heart and the passions and the passions of the heart, would be reincarnated because they needed to continuously re-experience all of the different passions of the heart over and over again through many lifetimes before Mm. they would move to the next level, which is the spirit-centered person. And the spirit-centered person then uh, could, could be reincarnated or had been reincarnated, but would eventually find their way 
to the upper mm. eons, as they were called, the highest heavens, um, in after they died. And so, mm. so that is the the Gnostic view, and definitely. When you think of Orthodox Christianity and this idea of eternal heaven, you live only one life, and at the end of that lifetime, you shall be judged, and you shall be judged to go either to eternal hell or eternal heaven, and then you have that gray purgatory area, right? right? And But this idea of an eternal hell is pretty serious, that... The, <laughs> there's not a lot of traditions which will go so far as to say there's no redemption right. whatsoever. And you have only one shot at it. <laughs> and you only have, yeah, exactly. That's pretty <laughs> radical, I have to say. If, if <laughs> someone came to me and said, I'm going to offer you my religion. Let me see if you'll accept it as for the future of your soul. Now, you either get eternal hell or you get eternal heaven. That's it. And one lifetime to get there. Like, mm. I, I think it's a radical. Even if you're a baby dead in the crib. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a pretty radical view of the cosmos to to say that there is such a thing as eternal hell. And I and I'm right. amazed that that it became the, the mainstream. Yeah, yeah. yeah the the standard mm. view for millions and millions of people across history. Right? It's it's quite it it, it amazes me. But uh, the you can you can get you can get people to believe probably they will. We had us think so. Well, the fear works, right? Yeah, it, the on fear. the level of fear, it works very effectively. And of course, the yeah, there's no hell without fear. I yeah. mean, you need that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think it works with children, but uh, yeah. to, to continue to believe in this as an adult it takes, I don't know, a degree of ignorance, I would go so far as to say, uh, to, to, to believe that. To condemn other people to and and people who are not in your religion, to condemn mm. them to eternal hell is, is phenomenal to me. Not notwithstanding everybody who lived before Jesus. Yeah, as well. They're yeah, screwed. Yeah, yeah. Well, no one lived before Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So a Stone Age person could be saved according to mainstream Christian. <laughs> there were no dinosaurs. We can't explain that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but but even even in traditional, but they didn't manage to purge everything. I mean, for example, one example in the mainstream canonical Bible is that they ask Jesus whether he was this dude who became who came before yeah since yeah. yeah that's one thing and there's also another jesus talks a story of someone who was born blind or something and they ask was that because of his sinful acts in the previous life so there are like traces in the mainstream bible mm. where you can clearly see but what you're saying is that yeah in the contemporary culture all the stuff that didn't make it to the bible it was a given there yeah, and uh, I do question this whole purgatory concept, though, because that's definitely, you know, uh, but you you can't see it in in uh, I think in, is it in Plutarch? Uh, you can't see the idea, but there it is. The weighing of the soul is not meant to be a place you end up. It's like a process in the reincarnation wheel, mm. and. I think the same is true for when, when they imported the concept of hell and Satan. Didn't they take it from Zoroastrianism? Exactly, or from even the Muslim tradition. That I'm thinking about uh, Dante and his three, you know, his right. divine comedy where he goes from hell to purgatory to paradise, and that scholars have found that there's actually a lot of uh, Muslim influence on Dante's and uh, Dante's entire divine comedy. Interesting. And this purgatory idea, it enters into Christianity and w the tradition that I come from of Catholicism, where grandmothers would like pray the rosary over and over again so that the sins of their relatives would be forgiven and they would be liberated from hell. You know, this is it's a very deeply ingrained idea that in traditional Catholicism, that, that by praying for the dead, you can liberate them from, from purgatory, basically. Hmm, that's very shamanic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the ancestor <laughs> worship yeah, I mean, of the old religions. Yeah. So, so what I mean is, within the Catholic tradition, I don't know where it fits in in terms of the theology, but within the Catholic tradition, there is this idea that of purgatory where you're 
praying for the souls that are lost in this kind of afterlife place mm. and uh, and can be liberated into heaven uh, at through through what they go through in purgatory yeah is burning mm. off their sins and, and things like this mm. interesting it's a very strange idea but it kind of brings reincarnation <laughs> to a degree into mainline catholicism because it tells you that there's a way to work off your karma you know there's a way to, to right right uh, free yourself of your karma right there is this conspiracy theory that says that the reason they were burning the sages, it was important to burn them, was to traumatize them so much that they would not reincarnate. Uh -huh. they, like normally they were reincarnate at a higher level because evolution, right? So you can't be stupider than what you were before. But if you traumatize them during, and of course the Catholics had confiscated all the magical writings and philosophy, they knew what was up and what these people believe. So with, by traumatizing them, with burning them alive, they make sure that they kind of dump in their classes of reincarnation and come back, you know, confused and forgot, forgetful. Mm. And hands won't constitute a problem. Hands won't challenge our uh, power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. So that's interesting. But that, of course, that presupp presupposes that they acknowledge that reincarnation is real, but we have to keep everyone down mm -hmm. you know to maintain our power yeah kind of like the chinese leaders and the dalai lama mm. but i do think that part of the gnostic world view is that the afterlife journey has a definite structure mm. and in this life it's important to try and understand the journey through the afterlife and in many cultures actually that's the case where the afterlife is not just a judgment where either you go to heaven or hell, which is to say what the Christian view is, but rather the afterlife is that underworld going all the way back to ancient Egypt, if you want. It's a journey through the 12 gates. And during that journey, you you start to review your life and what you did it, it, there is a judgment but it's a judgment which is a form of life review where at each stage you look at the, the things you did and how you acted and so on and i think that is very important mm. that if we approach our lives now with the understanding that when we die we're going to have this gradual review of the things that we do and have done. And it's very kind of laid out in such a structure in a way that we can uh, analyze and apply it to our own lives. And as we live it now, it's a very useful thing. You know, it, it's it's mm. it's it, uh, someone who is a complete nihilist who kind of believes that we live once we die and our body just gets the atoms get spread out into the cosmos again i don't understand their moral code so much because you have to believe in the consequences of your deed and, and this is a structure that allows you to review the consequences of your deeds right right yeah a, a concept of car model yeah well that's well that's that's very interesting as well, mm. uh, because the West, <laughs> when I, tra I traveled in the East, and the thing that struck me the most was how people feel karma. It, it's there in the way that they interact with each other. And we mm. miss that in the West. We, we don't right. interact with each other with this awareness of karma, or the karma that accrues. No, we think we can get away with stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. is very strange to go to a different culture and feel karma in human interaction, which is what happens. I mean, not absolutely, of course, but in general, uh, it mm. was definitely tangible for me when I was in India and in Nepal. And Tibet. And uh, it, it, we really, it, without karma, what do we have? Uh, uh, a general code of conduct, you know? Mm. Of, yeah, but, but it's just as absurd how far they're taking it in some Protestant versions where it doesn't matter what you do or did. It doesn't matter if you baptize. Nothing matters except redeem, redeem, redeem. Believe, 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 mm -hmm. and yeah. bombs. You, you can abuse it in Catholicism too. Okay, I was out, I was raping, I was plundering, I was torturing, I was murdering. Now, give me a absolution, Holy Father, and I'm good again, right? So they have that mechanism to, pe 
to and then there in the protestant no it's enough that you believe i i remember when i was in school as a child i asked two christian girls who was bullying a blind boy mm. that isn't this what you because uh, my parents were agnostic so i grew up without belief and i said didn't you don't your religion forbid this thing i mean what would jesus say etc and they said no because we are baptized and we believe and if we believe then we can do anything mm. and we are good yeah. <laughs> that's that's a protestant extremism of that but i can see how these things come about because they needed pe- to whip up people to go on to crusades and you know um what they did with the witches and the Qatars and all that stuff if they need people to go against the Christian mm-hmm. uh, moral right. then they also need a, you know, a loophole mm-hmm. absolutely no it's funny how the, the moral code becomes very flexible depending on <laughs> <laughs> on, exactly. the, on the agenda at hand <laughs> yeah. but you know what that, what that means it means that w- this is very agnostic because it means that the, at the end of the day everybody has an individual responsibility and then we're back to your pet peeve that we should consider these things at an individual basis and you know build up a paradigm mm-hmm. within our tradition if you so choose yeah that um, can't be used at a collective level but it can at an individual yeah i mean this is where i say that the the, the gnosticism uses a form of psychology because they basically see the soul as composed of these negative emotions that are constantly kind of coming up, which is to say hatred and anger and desire and and fear. And it's really about constantly being aware of those things. Now, obviously, they come up from the inside. They're provoked from the outside, but they come up from the inside. And it's psychology in the sense that you are responsible for the way you respond to your own anger and and fear and and things like this. So Mm. taking responsibility for your response to the situation is a very important idea that has nothing to do with what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil right is uh, mm. it's it's not a moral code it's a it's a, oh no uh, an awareness of self an awareness of how the self is acting in these different contexts mm. yeah 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 i agree mm. hey should we take a quick break and uh, make a leak and fill a coffee and then continue sure that's fine with me mm. okay so i'll be back in a moment yep yep okay, okay. okay. All of our files are free and will remain free. If you like the show, you can show support by donating $1 to help with expenses. Just use the PayPal link on our website, YouTube channel, or Facebook page. Thanks. Thanks. 